All right, good morning. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, this morning we're going to be talking about Incident Command System and National Incident Management System. Uh, my name is Steve Marr. I'm with Risk Management Professionals, and I'll be turning it over to Chief Scott Adams in just a moment. But let me talk briefly about logistics. Uh, given that this is a webinar and it involves uh, people at remote locations, um, the uh, potential for cross-chatter that's very disruptive to people who are listening is significant, so everybody does need to be kept on mute um, for the duration of the presentation. At the end of the presentation, uh, if you uh, request, uh, send a chat message to our producer, Nicola Tromba, she'll go ahead and uh, unmute you, and we can interact. You can pose questions to the speaker uh, during the question and answer session. Also, during the presentation, if there are important questions or issues that need to be raised, also feel free to send chat messages uh, to Nicole. Um, so I guess those are some of the key logistics. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Chief Adams. Uh, Chief Adams was with the fire service for 28 years, a large fraction of that time with the uh, Torrance Fire Department, and for 11 and a half years he served as the uh, chief for the Torrance Fire Department. Uh, since then he's been doing a number of workshops at the community college level, uh, teaching classes at the community college level and a number of workshops uh, that are specialized in teaching full, full uh, levels of uh, incident command system, national incident management system, uh, providing exercises both at the tabletop level and also at the functional level and field exercises too. Uh, today Scott is going to be giving a little bit of an overview uh, for the incident command system and national incident management system and I'll turn it over to him. All right. Thank you, Steve. You got it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Well, we, as Steve mentioned, we're going to be talking about NIMS. That's the National Incident Management System and ICS. It's called the Incident Command System. And we're going to talk about, first of all, what is it? And then we're going to talk about why, why is it in existence and why do you, as someone from industry or an agency who is not a police or a fire department, why do you need the Incident Command System and the National Incident Management System. Why should you participate? Why should you be conversant with how it works? And then who in particular should be involved in learning about the Incident Command System and implementing it in your organization in order to make you and your organization more effective? So what is it? What is the National Incident Management System, Incident Command System, what are they for, and where did they come from? But we'll start with the what. If you get nothing else from this morning's presentation, one of our people here in the uh, training room is, is Bob, and Bob is my perfect target audience for my intended presentation this morning. He has some awareness of the fact that ICS and NIMS exist, not really sure what it's all about in particular, and why it might be important for him to know that for his business and, and, and whatnot. So this slide, if you get nothing else this morning, this will help you understand what it's all about. If you think about an emergency, and let's define emergency first this morning. All of us in our day-to-day -day work have incidents that happen that we can handle internally that I just call the routine uh-oh stuff. And I'm not going to classify that as an emergency. An emergency is when something happens and you go the big uh-oh, and it occurs to you that this may not be over in the next 10 or 20 minutes or the next hour or two, or maybe not even at the end of my work day today. So that's a real emergency, and when an emergency happens, we all arrive there, and typically if you've got something significant happening at your facility, you're not going to handle it by yourself, even if you can. Other agencies are going to arrive. Someone's going to call 911. There'll be stakeholder agencies that may be governing bodies like Fish and Game, EPA. They're going to show up, and they're going to have the press. They're going to have demands of you for both information and action. So all these entities are going to arrive at an emergency, and we all get there from our own world of experience. So no matter what business you're in, even coming from the fire service, we have our own lingo, our own shorthand language. Engineers have it. Chemical people have it. Industrial people have it. Food service people have it. We all have that shorthand that we use that works very well inside of our agencies. We have our own cultural norms. We've developed our own ways of doing business that work very well for us. But if you think about an emergency as a foreign land that we're all going to arrive upon to manage an emergency, and we all get there with our own cultural norms, our own language, our own ways of doing business, that creates, and I, I was polite here, I said it creates the likelihood 
of mass confusion. I can tell you from 40 years of emergency management experience now that there will be mass confusion. And one of the sayings we have in emergency management is you are information dependent. When you first get there, you may know something bad has happened, but you don't know exactly why. You don't know who's involved. You don't know if it's over or just getting started. You don't know if it's going to get worse. So you're starved for information, and the incident's driving you to take some kind of action. So when you arrive at this scene and people are getting there, you want to be able to close this gap between being starved for information and needing to take action to having the proper information so that you can take action. When you add to that multiple agencies showing up that all use a different cultural norm, all use a different language, you have the potential for massive communications confusion. And I can tell you from personal experience, that's how people get hurt and killed in managing emergencies. And, it's, and also, just for the sake of efficiency, we need a system that allows us all to speak one language, operate under the same rules, so that we have an efficient way to incorporate everybody's input and their real needs and responsibilities. So think of the incident command system. And, and NIMS, ICS, is really a subset of the National Incident Management System. And you'll see how that works in a moment when I talk to you about how we got to where we are today with NIMS and ICS. But the incident command system is a language and a culture that we can have all studied in advance so that when we do arrive at this emergency, we can legitimately bring our own expertise and our own experience in managing whatever piece of that emergency we really own. And we can all speak one language, be efficient, not compound the communications problem and the information deficit problem, and actually bond very quickly into a single way of doing business for efficiency's sake. And so we're talking life safety, also resource management, being efficient on the emergency scene to not waste resources. So anyway, it's really a language and a culture. Too often we think, and I, when I speak to the regulated community about this when I was a fire chief, it's this idea that, oh, well, you're going to see a lot of lines and boxes in this organizational structure. And, we're, and we tend to think of it that way. All well, ICS is this organization chart. But it's really a way of thinking and doing business that will help us be more effective. And so if you, if you come away with nothing else this morning, uh, come away with that. It really is a way to have us all be more efficient by working together. So how did we get here? Well, I, I'm proud to tell you that the incident command system itself was born right in the fire service. And I'd like to be able to tell you that's because over all of our years in history in the fire service, we have been a really together, coordinated, super progressive organization. But if I told you that, I'd be lying to you. The truth of it is, is that in the late 60s and early 70s here in Southern California especially, where there were, for instance, 53 separate fire agencies just in Los Angeles County alone, we had a lot of brush areas out in the Hollywood Hills and Santa Monica Mountains and all of that. And up until the late 50s, early 60s, the only thing that was out there was Bambi and Thumper. There wasn't a lot of large life loss potential or property loss potential. And when we've, we've had major campaign fires in those areas pretty much forever, but it didn't matter. We typically would watch it burn down to the ocean, turn a couple of feet of sand into glass, say we did a good job and go home. Well, what happened was in the late 60s and in the early 70s, there was significant development, what we now call the urban wildland interface. And there was high value structures in those areas and a large potential for life loss. And what we discovered was instead of one or two fire departments showing up, we now needed hundreds of resources, hundreds of fire engines, hundreds of thousands of firefighters. And when we all got to the scene, even though we were all in the same business, well, we all showed up in our shiny red fire engines. We discovered that each fire organization had its own lingo, its own cultural norms, its own ways of doing business. And when we got together, we frankly did a terrible job of coordinating and creating a plan for an organized attack, in this case, on wildland fires. So we decided that there had to be a better way to do this because we weren't doing real well at it. And so in 1970 in Riverside County, California, there was an entity put together called FireScope. And it was a group of stakeholders from the fire service. And our task at the time was to create a new way to be able to combine lots of resources so that we could, guess what, all speak one language, have one common way of doing things, and hopefully be more efficient. Uh, it was hugely successful. And the fire service, obviously, there was no regulation at this time. This was something the fire service invented 
for our own efficiency and, frankly, survival. And so it began to spread in Southern California first, interestingly enough, it hopscotched over to Phoenix, Arizona, who became one of the early proponents of what they call Fire Ground Command, ICS. And then, frankly, Oklahoma City, where the uh, Fire Service Training Institute was at the University of Oklahoma. And so it spread locally. If you fast forward to about the late 80s and early 90s, ICS was used extensively in Southern California. It was beginning to spread north, and as I mentioned, spreading east. And in 1991, you'll all remember the very large Oakland Hills fire. And look at the stats, 25 people dead, 2,843 homes destroyed. And guess what happened? The Oakland Fire Department, a very capable fire organization, had help coming across the Bay Bridge from San Francisco. And guess what they discovered? They didn't speak a common language. They weren't using the incident command system. They couldn't even hook their equipment together. There was no interoperability between fire hydrant connections and whatnot. And it was a, a terrible consequence. Now, it was a serious fire, and even if they'd had everything all squared away, it still would have been serious. But they were floundering around for lack of common radio frequencies, common ways to talk to each other. In the fire service, every other person's rank is chief this or that or the other, and knowing who was in charge of what part of the incident was very problematic. And unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately, one of the people who lived in the Oakland Hills whose house burned down was Senator Petrus. And so he went back to Sacramento and said, as we did earlier in the late 60s, there's got to be a better way to do this. And ended up passing uh, Senate Bill 1841, which became in California not now just the incident command system, but California stole it, called it the Standardized Emergency Management System for California SEMS. And it was instituted and made law. So from about 1993, when it made it into the government code, Police agencies, fire agencies in California were now mandated to use the incident command system as a standardized way to manage emergencies. And from there, it began to spread where some public works, public service agencies and whatnot began to use ICS, or at least partially. And so that's how it began to develop. Now, because of the press that we have in the fire service, our own internal house magazines and national magazines, the concept of ICS was really beginning to spread across the entire United States, principally in the fire service and a little bit in police services. Fast forward to 9-11. There was a real problem in 9-11 in coordinating resources. New York Fire and Police were doing a good job using the incident command system as best they could, but when you began to bring in outside resources on a large scale, they exhausted two of the largest public safety organizations on the planet, New York Police and Fire. They began to exhaust their resources in a, in a hurry. It tragically lost a lot of the folks that were the first responders. But that incident pulled in resources from everywhere. Look at Katrina, pulled in resources from everywhere. You know there was a, a lot of difficulty in moving resources to and coordinating resources, coordinating evacuation efforts. And it was a real mess. And now, not just at the state level, but at the federal level, the federal government looked at both of those incidents after the fact it said there's got to be a better way to manage large-scale emergencies so that all these resources coming from all these different locations can what? Speak one language, have one common way of doing business in order to be safer and to be more effective in managing emergencies. So now what happened was we came up with the National Incident Management System. Fortunately for those of us here on the West Coast, they looked out west and said, hey, those guys in California have this SEMS thing, which is based on the incident command system, which was invented by the fire service in Southern California. And so we now have two presidential directives under President Bush for the management of domestic incidents and for national preparedness. And they are the genesis of the, now the national incident management system. And a part, a key part of NIMS for those of us that are boots on the ground in managing an emergency, is still the incident command system, and it's still called that. Now, NIMS itself is much larger than just ICS. At the federal level, they want to have a consistent nationwide template for managing emergencies. It enables federal, state, tribal, and local governments and the private sector and non-governmental organizations to work together. And they do that by not only responding to, ICS is basically focused on responding to and mitigating the emergency. NIMS is bigger because it talks about how do we prevent 
respond to and then recover from and then even mitigate in advance the impacts of a large-scale emergency in the United States. And again, the key is that ICS and the NIMS system using ICS works well regardless of the cause of the incident, the size of the incident, its location, or its complexity. So in the fire service, we will use the incident command system for something as simple as one fire engine rolling out on a dumpster fire behind a grocery store. Or it can be used for a major fire campaign, as you often see on the news across the nation from the, the hills above Malibu, or above Los Angeles, where they have thousands of firefighters there combating a wildland fire. Or certainly on events uh, like the current event we have going on, I'm certain, uh, in the Gulf Coast that the incident command system of NIMS is being brought to bear on trying to manage that difficult situation. And again, it's all there in order to reduce loss of life. Those are always our priorities. Yes, sir? Okay. To reduce loss of life, to protect the property and the environment, and again, effective use of our resources and the safety of the responders in the field. So what is the incident command system? Let's spend a few minutes. And again, my objective today is not to teach you how to be able to operate under ICS, but to teach you uh, sort of the concept of what is that culture and language of ICS. And it's based on five basic functions that are common to any emergency. And frankly, you all who are part of a public agency or a private business, you're doing these same five functions every day. You're probably calling them something else, but they still exist. But in ICS, these are all terms of art or specific terms that we use. And the key to understanding ICS is understand the idea that it's based on common functionality and common terminology working together. So we've got these five basic functions under ICS and NIMS. One is the command element, and that's what we call it. When I was uh, the chief of the Florence Fire Department, I was the person in command, and my title was fire chief. But if I were on a major incident, my title changes that day. I'm part of the command of that incident. And if I was the person in charge of that incident, my title would become incident commander. So there's a command function. Then there's an operations function, and that's everyone who is actually boots on the ground fixing the emergency or directly assisting in mitigating the emergency would be in what they call the operations section. Then there's a section called planning. And those are the folks who are thinking ahead. When you get that uh-oh factor that's escalated to the point where you're thinking, gee, this may not be over at the end of my shift, but what's this incident going to look like 10 minutes from now or two hours from now or three days from now? Who, somebody needs to start thinking about what are our plans now? What kind of contingency plan should we have for this incident? Are we tracking what's happening? Are we creating visuals so that when we eventually turn command over to somebody else, because the incident commander, no matter how talented he or she may be, after about 12 hours, your carriage turns into a pumpkin, and it's time for someone else to take over. So someone needs to be thinking ahead in order to brief the oncoming crews and to roll this incident forward. Then there's a logistics function. Everything that has to be in support of the people in the operation section who are directly combating the emergency, they'll need what? Perhaps food, perhaps lodging, radio communications, transportation, expendable supplies, anything you can think of, the logistics section would be responsible for securing it and moving it about and supplying and supporting and rehabilitating and resting and feeding all the people that are responding to emergency. And then finally, there's finance and administration. It's a critical part of managing an emergency. You have to track who's at the scene, how do they get paid, if they get injured, what kind of claims to take care of them to get them medical assistance, at least making the, the uh, financial arrangements for that, who's tracking the cost for recovery. For those of you in private industry who may be involved in a uh, major, let's say you're caught on the Gulf Coast during a Katrina type event, you need to be thinking and using ICS to start tracking your expenses because you may be eligible for federal recovery. Unless you've done a good job in a NIMS and ICS compliant way, I can guarantee you that you may get your recovery, but you're going to be at the back of the line in comparison to the people who've done a yeoman-like job of using the NIMS system to do that. So there's these five functions in ICS, and that's the key to understanding it. They're always called command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance administration. 
And if you think about it, whatever world you come from or from whatever business you're in, you're doing this every day. Somebody who's in charge of the business, who's making the big decisions on what business are we in, how much are we going to do, and when. And then somebody is doing operations. If you make widgets, then somebody in your organization is in charge of all the people that are making those widgets. Someone else in your organization is in charge of, well, how many widgets are we going to make? What does the market demand look like over the next six, eight months? Planning, tracking, projecting. Then there's folks that are buying all the raw materials you need to make those widgets and making sure that your supply chain is working just right. So you've all got your own names for these things, and then you've got finance and admin. How do we pay for the materials? How do we cost out what a widget costs so that we know we're making a profit? So no matter what world you come from, you're already doing these things, and you've already got your own names for them. When we roll into an emergency management structure under the incident command system within the national incident management system, we roll into these five basic functions that you already do every day, but we call the people who are doing them specific titles. We call their functions those specific things so that when we all work together, we know what it is we're talking about as we manage the emergency. So you do those things every day. In an emergency, you merely do them in a specific language and culture that everybody understands, and typically you'll do them much faster than you might on a, a normal work week. Now these five functions might reside in only one person who is the incident commander. The incident command system, another thing to you know, understand about it that's important is it's a top-down driven organizational structure. So if I were a rookie firefighter and I walked into a room and the trash can in the corner was on fire and there was a fire extinguisher hanging, hanging on the wall, I discovered the incident, I'm the incident commander. I'm the, I may only be in charge of this incident for the next 15 seconds, but I'm that initial incident commander. And in that case, if I'm a properly trained rookie firefighter, I could very easily have an incident plan in my head that, gee, there's a fire extinguisher, there's a fire, it's in the incipient stages, I'm capable of handling it, so I create a, a plan of attack. Logistics, the extinguisher's there, I can see that the little arrow's in the green, so I'm taken care of logistically. Finance administration, I know our fire department has a contract to get this extinguisher recharged when I'm done. So I never take off any of those hats of the ICS system all five of those functions under ICS reside in me as one firefighter. I take the extinguisher, I take action, boom. The organization never got any larger than one person. Let's roll into the Gulf Coast right now. If you take ICS as the org structure begins to grow, and it grows for two reasons, and they're really linked, the incident will become larger and more complex, which automatically means more people are going to show up. And so one of the keys to the incident command system is maintaining a reasonable, what they call a reasonable span of control. And that typically means that any one supervisor in the organization is supervising between three and seven direct reporting elements, and the optimum number is five. And so as more people start to show up, you take those five basic functions under ICS, and here again, we've got the incident commander he or she is responsible for everything until it's delegated. So the first thing that happens is you've got a really big incident, and so lots of emergency workers show up at the scene, so they become part of the operations section. This incident commander is going to take off the hat of operations section, and the title for that would be an operations section chief. So the IC is no longer directly responsible for all the workers. The ops section chief is and then he or she will be breaking into branches, divisions, and groups, all of which maintain a reasonable span of control of operating units. Just, just that simple. So it's a way of thinking and acting to maintain control. Planning will start breaking into units about where are our resources, what is the situation now, what's it going to look like later, how do we do document production and everything, because they're kind of the biz hub for the whole emergency to provide people with documentation. And they're already starting to think about demobilizing. If you've got hundreds or thousands of people on the scene, you need to start thinking about who gets to go home when, how you do that in an orderly, sane fashion. It's actually a fairly big project. And the logistics will typically break itself into service and support branches. And again, we talked about communications and medical and food and ground support, and facilities and supplies. They'll start to organize in a reasonable span of control as more people arrive at the scene and the incident becomes more complex. So you can go from one person to literally thousands of people, 
all working under the incident command system, under the National Incident Management System to manage an emergency. Now, interestingly enough, it doesn't matter where you come from or what discipline you're in. If you arrive at the scene of an emergency and report to the proper location that we'll talk about in a few minutes, you can plug yourself in and, based on your own area of expertise, be used very quickly in managing an emergency. So an uh, example of that from the Torrance Fire Department, we had uh, some, we'd been working to develop some specialized tools with the High Shear Technology Company for, uh, for cutting rebar. And when the Oklahoma Federal Building was blown up, about six hours after that happened, two of my Torrance firefighter specialists who helped develop those tools were on an airplane with a belly full of those tools headed to Oklahoma City, and the only instructions they had was report to the base at their incident command system location, tell them your capability, and plug yourself into the system. And because my folks knew how to speak the language and operate under ICS, a very few hours after that, they were up teaching people how to cut rebar in that building with these brand new specialized tools. Very efficient. So big incident, small incident. So what is, let's talk a little bit more about what else is standard. Obviously terminology is a big thing that has to be standard, so the people who run it have common names. Operations section chiefs, strike team leaders, task force leaders, branch directors. And I'm not going to bore you with all those specific things, but as that organization chart develops and gets bigger, the people in charge of it have set aside whatever their day-to-day -day title is. You know, I'm the president of uh, operations at XYZ Foods Company. No, today you might be the operations section chief managing an emergency at XYZ Foods Company. Uh, and that's how that works. The functionality always stays the same. Command, operations, planning, logistics, finance, administration. And using that terminology and functionality Excuse me, we establish command. How do you establish and transfer command from one incident commander to the next if an incident rolls on for a long time? Or if someone in more authority and experience arrives at the scene of the incident to transfer command to them? Or if someone from another agency arrives that should be the principal managing agency for that incident? An example from my world might be we go out on a house fire that seems insignificant but we discover there's a dead body in the house that's got a bullet hole in its forehead. What went to, from a small fire that the fire department was legitimately in charge of is now a crime scene that the police department might should be in charge of. So we'll transfer command to the police department. So other agencies. We want to maintain a single chain of command. If you have multiple chains of command from XYZ Foods and then that local city fire department, and then that local city police department, all operating independently at the scene of that emergency, that's a great way to lose people, to give un unintentionally conflicting orders and having different priorities for managing that emergency. That creates a mess, it's inefficient, and it hurts people. You don't want to do that. And then having what we call unified commands. To those of you in the private sector that are watching this webinar, let me tell you that this concept of unified command under ICS is now your ticket to the dance. And I know that a common complaint from private sector folks forever, and it's legitimate, has been, we have an emergency, we have some trained responders, we're taking appropriate action, we call 911, the fire department shows up, and they take over and shove us out of the way. And I've always thought that that was stupid, because typically in a business, the people that run it have critically important information and expertise in the equipment that's being used, in the processes that are being used, and the fire department desperately needs that information in order to be effective. So if the fire department may have legal responsibility for all the dirt in their city or county, they can't just release that. They are, by law, in charge of that emergency. But this idea of unified command that we'll talk about in a minute is a way to have both of those structures meld together under ICS so that all the perspectives are brought together in the decision-making process. ICS uses planning and organizational structures. We've talked about management by objectives, and that basically is everybody working at an emergency is given specific, achievable objectives to be completed within a certain time frame, and we call that an operational period. Everybody knows what that means. There'll be what they call an incident action plan. All the leaders running the emergency have that. All their people know what their objectives are. They know what the IAP says, which may tell them about special hazards that exist at the emergency and all of those sorts of things. 
it's modular organization so that as the incident gets larger in terms of you know, it spreading and more people arriving, you continue to break it into smaller and smaller pieces so that you maintain that ideal span of control of between three to seven with the optimum being five, and that's critical for safety. There are facilities and resources under ICS, again, that have common names. You've probably heard the term incident command post. That's a term of art in ICS. That's a place from which the incident is being run. But there's other ones. There are things called bases and camps and staging areas that all mean specific things under ICS. A base is a place where all of your incoming resources will report. If you have a major incident happening, do you want all of your responding resources to show up right at the incident or all show up right at the command post? I think not, really. You want to put them someplace where they can be accounted for, although people are there, they can get briefed on what's happening before they're given a specific assignment. So you always call that the base. Then the camps are places where you rehab people, staging areas are where you will uh, store people who are ready to go into combat so that as you rotate troops in and out of managing the emergency, you have a, a logical place to put them. And those things all contribute to this concept of interoperability under the incident command system. So it doesn't matter whether you're a firefighter from Torrance, California, or in my case, a firefighter that I met from Wairica, California, which is basically on the Oregon border, that showed up in Los Angeles. That fire captain, that fire engine to plug in to an emergency. So can someone from Fish and Game. So can someone from XYZ Foods. So can someone from the EPA. So can someone from the federal government all speaking the same language, talking about the same common functionality, using the same common terminology as we manage the emergency. You can imagine that shortens up the confusion period in the beginning when you're giving directions and receiving information. Very important. ICS also is a lot about managing communications and information. We have a bullet here that says integrated communications. Well, that is what systems are we using, everything from what radio bands, what frequencies, and obviously you don't want the people who are seeing the, the subway sandwiches arrive for all the responders. You don't want them talking over the same channels as the folks who are commanding the emergency rescue of people trapped in the building. So deciding on what your communications channels are, what particular modes are used, and then channeling those communications is very important. Information and intelligence. Obviously, you need as much information about what's happening and what might happen as you possibly can reported so that everybody at the emergency has what they call a common operating picture of what's happening. You don't want to use the mushroom theory in managing an emergency where some people are kept in the dark and fed on fertilizer. You need to have everybody have a clear picture of what's happening for safety. And then these days with the threat of and always the question mark in the back of our minds is, how did this happen? Was there some bad actor in there that's caused this to happen? The whole idea of gathering intelligence and managing intelligence is very, very important. And then under the incident command system, NIMS, there's a whole issue of training standards for people functioning in these various positions and the credentialing of both people and equipment. And then finally, there's a lot to say about how we should act as professionals uh, in the system and how do we remain accountable within the system to do a good job and how do we dispatch and deploy ourselves. So that's basically what ICS is. It's a common functionality using a common language so that anyone from any discipline can bring their expertise in managing an emergency and have their voice heard in the decision making that results in, first of all, the safety of the responders, the protection of the property and the lives of people who may be trapped or victims of whatever the incident is, and then finally being careful about the environment. So why? Well, it almost begs the question now, doesn't it? We say, we have, and I'm speaking to those of you primarily in the private sector, we've got our own way of operating that works just fine for our business. You've got your own titles and your own organizational structure, and Monday through Friday and whatever your schedule is, that works just great for you. Why should we have to change that during an emergency? And isn't this NIMS ICS just for police and fire departments or other emergency responders? Well, let's, let's talk about that. Up until 2009, you might have been able to make a good argument about that, really, but since Katrina and 9-11, that concept is going away. In 2009, the feds rolled out what they call the National Response Framework because even as they started developing the National Incident Management System, they began to realize, because they originally focused on police, fire department, military as 
principal responders, they began to realize very quickly that other government agencies and non-governmental agencies, the Red Cross, all kinds of volunteer organizations that show up to help, the average civilian who just shows up to help, and the private sector has an incredible amount of resources that need to be brought to bear in managing an emergency. So they broadened the concept of NIMS through this national response framework to bring everybody under the same umbrella, essentially. So it's based on best practices and stakeholder input. It builds on NIMS. It creates coordinating structures that align key roles and responsibilities at all levels of government and with NGOs and the private sector. It's always in effect, this national response framework. And it establishes a response vision through five key principles. Let's talk about that for a minute. Engage partnership. This is at all levels. We develop shared response goals and align our capabilities so that no one is overwhelmed in times of crisis. Tiered response. One of the good things about the NIM system and the Fed's position on this is that any emergency should be handled at the lowest appropriate level. They're not going to come in and take over the XYZ Foods Company's incident or the Torrance Fire Department's incident. They're there to assist if we need help, but it should be tiered up from the bottom at the lowest appropriate level. The whole idea of NIMS and ICS under the National Response Framework is that it's flexible and adaptable. It's not handcuffed. It's a toolbox. So it expands or contracts depending on the, the needs of the organization. And then unity of effort through unified command. I mentioned earlier this term of art in ICS called unified command is the sort of ticket to high-level participation in managing the emergency in your own business. It, unity of effort respects the chain of command, and each participating organization, while harnessing seamless coordination across jurisdictions in support of common objectives. And then the final thing is readiness to act. Basically, this is a lesson from Katrina. One of the things the feds did, they were kind of arguing with each other over which department was responsible for what, and they're all waiting for the magic words to come up from Louisiana, you know, from the mayor of New Orleans to the governor to the FEMA, which never happened. And so there was a lot of waiting around, and now the federal government has said, it's okay for all you federal departments. As a matter of fact, all of us, public sector, private sector, non-governmental, when we see something bad starting to develop in a region, start leaning forward. <laughs> Start moving resources in that direction. We should all be thinking that. We have a forward-leaning posture. Two of these key things I think are very important for us to understand as private sector people. This tiered response. Incidents always begin and end locally, and most are managed at the local level. Many incidents require a unified response from local agencies, the private sector, and NGOs. So if you're an XYZ company and you have something happen in some chemical process that you use, it's highly likely that the local emergency responders are going to show up, fire department at least, maybe their dedicated hazmat team. You may even have trained responders within your own organization. How do they interact? If you understand and use the incident command system in the creation of your emergency response documents that are all NIMS and ICS compliant, and you internally are using the incident command system, so someone in your organization is that initial incident commander, and your people are operating under ICS, when that fire department shows up, you can immediately ask to go into what they call unified command. So if the fire department doesn't shove you out of the way, you'll have an incident commander from your organization handcuffed together with that fire department incident commander, and they'll make joint decisions so that your technical expertise is melded with their staffing and capability and tools and equipment and almost unlimited resources through the mutual aid system to have a unified way to approach this emergency where everybody's perspective and priorities are taken into account and there's only one decision-making process. So unified command. And I can tell you this, if you know ICS and you speak the language and that fire department rolls in and you immediately say, yes, we've established a command post over here, Joe Blow is our incident commander, here's the action we've taken so far, you have instant credibility with that public safety agency because, oh, these people understand and use ICS? Great. And so you'll be given more credit and paid more attention to, frankly, in a way that you should have been all along. But now you have a, your ticket to the dance and asking, well, let's enter into unified command, a uh, very important part of the national response framework, and it's one of the key values in ICS. 
Unified Command, look at this. As a team effort, Unified Command allows all agencies with jurisdictional authority and or functional responsibility for the instance to provide joint support through mutually developed objectives and strategies. Very critical part of ICS. Here are two examples of how ICS works, especially here in California. It's my world to operate from. This first one, obviously resource management is very important. And whether you're a small company that's very self-sufficient or not, you could very easily be involved in incidents that you didn't even start. Could be a transportation accident, railroad, airline, weather related, some big storm, and all of a sudden you're in the middle of a regional emergency. And you're going to exhaust your local resources very quickly. So is your local police and fire department. In California, we'll have the field level where, where the incident occurs, the people in the field working it. Well, they're talking using the ICS system that's replicated through all these levels of government. They'll have an incident commander in the field, maybe more than one, talking to somebody in a local government emergency operations center that have those same five functions, command, operations, planning, logistics, and finance and admin. They'll be talking to an operational area. In California, that's a county. So let's say we're here in, uh, we're in Orange County. Is that correct? Irvine's in Orange County? OK. So there'll be uh, an Orange County operational area emergency operations center. So when the city of Irvine, where we are, runs out of resources, they may have heard from XYZ company that we've got a critical process here. And if we don't have five generators in the next two hours, something really bad is going to happen with our processes. That request goes up through the ICS chain of command through your local fire department to that local government's emergency ops center, to the county ops center to bring resources to that emergency that might end up at your company. And it'll happen very quickly. If the operational area, in our case, the county runs out of resources, there's three regions in the state, and then the state of California is the link to federal assistance. All of these entities operating under the National Incident Management System and the Incident Command System all speaking the same language, command, operations, planning, logistics, finance, and admin, all having the same titles. If they say, hey, I'm the incident commander at the XYZ incident, they know exactly who you are, where you are, and what it is you're dealing with. And so it's a way to coordinate who gets what resources in what order so that the critically important resources hopefully go to the right place. I teach a lot in Riverside County, and there's a little town there called Temecula where they have a wine and cheese festival every year. So I always make the joke that the Riverside operational area gets two requests, one from the city of Hemet, one from the city of Temecula, and they both need five emergency generators. Well, when they finally get into the coordination aspect of this, they, they realize that the five generators for Hemet are because they have five patients on dialysis that are going to die, but in Temecula, they need the five generators because the wine and cheese festival is going on and people are sitting in the dark drinking their wine. Well, somebody has to make the tough decision of where those resources go, right? So not working around the system in order to resources is a very important part of that, whether you're a business, a public safety agency, a city, a county, or whatever. Another really great example, under ICS and NIMS, there's a high value on having advanced planning to be involved in mutual aid and mutual assistance compacts and agreements. Well, here's a really terrific example from our world here in Southern California. In Riverside and San Bernardino County, there are a number of water providing agencies, typically districts, that have bonded together to form a mutual aid organization they call the Emergency Response Network of the Inland Empire. It's Ernie. And they're all hooked up by radio communications they're using the incident command system so that they're all speaking the same language, understand common functionality and common terminology, and it gives them a synergy for mutual training, joint exercises, and those sorts of things. And it works in parallel in real time with other things that are happening in the county in a major emergency. We had a big, large wildland fire in Riverside County this last year. Ernie activated itself. One of their members had their pump stations go down. Those pump stations were supplying the local firefighting effort. Another Ernie agency, they put out a mutual aid call within their Ernie agency operating under ICS. They had two huge generators delivered to that site within 45 minutes or an hour. And all operating under the incident command system just as smooth as you please. And all done by these agencies just decided that they wanted to be committed to ICS and them. And the important part is because they understood the bigger picture, they were able to report to in this case, the Riverside County operational area, 
that they had done this so that that resource allocation was coordinated with everything else that was going on in the county in terms of firefighting and, and resource acquisition. So it's very important. And without ICS and NIMS, it would be impossible for an organization like Ernie to be very effective. So two good examples. How about the who? In the final analysis, who should make the effort to become NIMS and ICS compliant? How can I know who in my organization should be trained and how much training they need? So let's talk about that for a minute. We could get into a discussion about who is actually required by law or regulation to have NIMS and ICS training. Some of you are for using hazardous materials and fall under certain uh, criteria for risk management plans and whatnot, especially here in California, and that's a large part of what risk management professionals is involved in, is helping you do that. But let me give you a more practical way to think about it. Because ICS and NIMS has become the de facto national standard on how to manage an emergency, I would tell you that my professional opinion is that if you have any desire to have an active role in managing the emergency of your facility, you need to be using ICS. Because unless that incident happens to stay contained to your building only, and no outside assistance or the press or anybody else shows up at your facility, you'll do fine using your own isolated system. But as soon as any outside responder, the EPA, Fish and Game, OSHA, your local fire department, your local police department, the Red Cross, anybody shows up and wants to know what's going on or have a say in that incident, they're all going to be using the ICS system under NIMS. And if you're the only party who's not using it, you're going to have great difficulty communicating and understanding what's going on, and you're more than likely going to lose control of that incident, which is probably not good for you. So very, very important, I think. So if you ever need to interface with anybody else, which is highly likely in any significant incident, you really should be conversant and have knowledge and ability in using the incident command system. Under the federal government's national response framework and the National Integration Center, they have a five-year training plan for NIMS, and that's kind of a long link there on the, on the screen. So if you want, you can just Google the National Incident Management System five-year training plan. It'll probably come up with a link to a, a PDF file. But I extracted a couple of little statements from this five-year training plan. It says, to achieve national prepare and prepare, preparedness excuse me, and coordinated response, emergency management and incident response activities must be coordinated at all levels of government, and it should, should include the private sector and non-governmental organizations where appropriate. And it talks about the presidential directives that set that out. Later on, it says preparedness activities should be coordinated among all appropriate agencies and organizations within the jurisdiction as well as across jurisdictions. And NIMS slash ICS provides the tools to ensure and enhance preparedness through the following roles. Preparedness organizations, elected and appointed officials, non-governmental organizations, and the private sector. So you really need to begin to take that seriously, I think, if you're going to have an effective role in managing your incident. So who should be trained? Well, certainly anyone who, at your business who's going to be in charge of an incident, looking at the big picture, and any of your workers who are actually going to be involved in trying to mitigate the incident or interface with outside agencies. And the beginning classes in ICS are really programs that FEMA has called IS-700, and that's basically an awareness program. It's an introduction. It's about three and a half or four hours long talks in much greater detail about the ICS system and that common terminology and functionality than I've been able to do this morning in our limited time. And then there's ICS 100 and 200 where it goes into a detailed description of ICS and actually begins to train people to function in those roles of incident commander or planning section chief or how to interface with others who are using that terminology. And then it goes on. There's many other courses where you might be trained to be a public information officer to deal with the press how to put out an emergency response notification, to become a planning section chief on what do you do to make plans and create an incident action plan, how do you set up a good logistics system, and the training becomes very advanced. There are several ways to actually receive ICS and NIMS training. One, you can be done online. There are web-based courses. You can go to uh, training.fema.gov and you'll end up at the Emergency Management Institute, and you'll see what courses are available online. 
The advantage of that is they are free. The disadvantage is they are, frankly, dry as dust. They take quite a while on the computer. You're doing it in isolation, and you don't have the advantage of any, having anybody speak to you that talks about real-world experience. How does this fit into your actual job? But it is free, and it is available online. Some local police and fire departments, depending on how busy they are and how they see their mission, will provide uh, training certainly to their other departments within the community and sometimes offer that training either free or for a fee to their local stakeholders. So you might want to contact your local fire department especially and see if they can provide ICS training. And then certainly here at Risk Management Professionals is a significant arm of what we do here and that's my involvement with uh, Risk Management Professionals to be an emergency response specialist and I teach and train on NIMS certified, FEMA certified courses and also to help organizations prepare by doing tabletop exercises and whatnot. So first of all, get the right people trained. How do you make this work in the real world? Well, we determine who needs what levels of training, and if you go to that five-year training document and begin to look at the FEMA website, it makes recommendations on who and what and to what level. We train to certify those folks. A critically important part of this is to make sure that whatever emergency response plans you have for your business, what I would call your source documents for managing an emergency, are really are cast in ICS terms, functionality, and what we would call being MIMS compliant. That's a good thing for plan approval, but it's also a practical reality as you begin to use those plans in the real world. And then from there, you branch out into doing tabletop exercises where typically internal people, typically at the management and first line supervisor, levels might get together and do some brainstorming on, hey, if we had an incident like this happen, what are the things that are important to us? What should our priorities be? How would we roll out and use the ICS system? And those are basically discussion-based exercises that begin to get people to think in that NIMS ICS culture, language, and functionality. And then from there, we'd move forward to do something like simple functional exercises where we basically set up command and management exercises to make sure that people fall into the roles and know what their responsibilities are, know how to access the source documents so where there would typically be checklists on what their responsibilities would be to make sure they don't miss something important in managing an emergency. And you'd move there to fully functional exercises that might go for a day or in the case of one of our clients uh, in 2008, we had basically a two full day live exercise for the, what they call Golden Guardian 2008, which is a huge earthquake exercise here in California, where they played at a full functional level for two full days real time. And we helped them craft the parameters for that exercise and their participation in it. And it was a, a huge success and they had a good time doing it and felt really good about their capability at the end of it. So and that's something you should consider too. Once you've done some internal exercises, begin to branch out, contact your local fire department when you have an exercise, invite them to come and play. They'd be happy to do that for the most part. And again, your credibility goes up, your ability to interface with them in a real emergency goes up. Uh, very, very important thing to do. So we've got NIMS and ICS. Remember, whether an incident's localized and fairly straightforward to handle, and you may have your own emergency response forces operating under ICS, is a standardized way to do it. As other resources show up, you'll be able to integrate with them quickly. Or Take a look at what's happening in the Gulf where we probably have thousands and thousands of people all trying to coordinate down there. The ICS system is flexible enough to expand in a modular way so that you maintain a reasonable span of control to handle a very large and very complex incident that involves everyone from local first responders all the way up through and including your federal government's response. So hopefully that gives you a little better idea of what ICS and NIMS is all about and why, it, why it's important to you in my professional opinion and uh, why you might want to make sure that your source documents are NIMS compliant and that the appropriate people in your organization uh, are able to use it effectively in managing an emergency in your facility. So with that, I'll just say thank you. And I want to thank my producer, Nicole, who's been over there keeping me live and on the air, hopefully. <laughs> and thanks to Steve Marr and RMP. And it's been a pleasure to be with you this morning. And one last thing that I'll leave you with, and this is the first time we've seen this. Um, we actually had a client come to us because they had been cited <laughs> by a fire agency uh, based on a code because they were one of these agencies that does handle a, uh, at least one hazardous material. And so in their 
emergency planning that's required by the state of California, at least one fire agency took NIMS compliance or ICS training as part of the requirement for preparation. And what you have here is an, an extract of actual notice of violation where their corrective action was to train their people on ICS. So this is the first time we've seen it as a, as a real legitimate regulatory ding on, on an agency, but this could be the future. And I, I think certainly as we see more and more of the acknowledgement of ICS and NIMS as the de facto national standard and the way and the only way to manage emergencies at the micro and macro level here in the United States, we may see more of this. But anyway, with that, we'll go to questions and answers, and I guess I give it back to Nicole for a minute. Any questions? Great job. No one has any questions. Oh, I, that, that's exactly what I thought. So if anyone has any questions, please type them to me or uh, let me know if you'd like to speak them out loud. Or if anyone else Actually, I'll just add to that, too. Um, anonymous questions are fine. If you'd like to post them anonymously to uh, Chief Adams, that's good. Uh, I'll turn something out, in, uh, out, at, uh, out at you, Scott. Uh, one of the slides there you talked about, uh, NIMS and um, unified command. Mm -hmm. And basically, a couple times it mentions uh, we're agencies working together. Yes. Uh, there have been cases in California where unified command has been uh, expanded on a discretionary basis uh, by the municipal authority to include industry uh, representatives and participants after they were trained, uh, after they participated in drills, and, um, and it demonstrated an ability to work under ICS and work with the municipal emergency responders. Does NIMS also recognize that, or do they encourage industry participation on a unified command level? A absolutely they do. And a matter of fact, one of the things I was thrilled to see when they developed the new national response framework was an open recognition that private sector people, industry, has critically important information and capability that, that must be brought to bear if you're going to manage an emergency effectively. And at, even at the local level, as a local fire chief, I always thought it was uh, somewhat of an injustice when the fire department was almost forced to move in, take over command of an incident in a way where, because we didn't know what the level of expertise was, because the folks that we were serving in that case weren't ICS familiar, we really had no choice. Because it's very difficult, you know, if you trust everybody, all the time, somebody's going to get hurt. A uh, few folks in industry know that full well. So this idea of having the knowledge and the training and then using unified command to join those two agencies together to make effective decisions to manage the incident, that is long overdue. And I tell when I teach our private sector clients, hey, this is your ticket to the dance. You know ICS, you understand, you speak it, you have expertise inside. When you marry up with that local fire department, most typically in most small jurisdictions at least, as your first contact with emergency response, you really now have the key to operating with that fire department to make joint decisions. And there's just logic to it. One of our clients, as you know, is a power generating company in, in Riverside. And one of the ways they make electricity is they have several 747 jet engines turning great big generators. And that's a fairly complex piece of equipment. And what I told them when I trained them is, do you want some local fire department hose jockey to come in there when you have a problem in a 747 engine running full tilt making, you know, 18 gigawatts of electricity and just start throwing water around? I don't think so. They may have the legal responsibility. They may have lots of manpower and resources that you need to manage this emergency, but you certainly have the knowledge and technical expertise to keep them from doing something dumb in public. And so knowing and operating under ICS and going into unified command is really your key to maintaining real input into the management of emergency in your facility. So, yeah, it's overdue. And NIMS at the federal level, they encourage that all over the place. Think about it at the federal level. There are many large and even international construction companies, for instance, that are huge in terms of their ability to bring resources to an incident, earth-moving equipment, you name it, building construction, whatever. The, the federal government finally sees those as critical national resources in a real national emergency. 
So for those folks to be able to operate under NIMS ICS and incorporate that private resource essentially into a federal response is critically important. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Nicole, did you have some other questions that have come up? I do, and I was asking Mark if he would like to speak it out loud, but um, I think I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, Mark wants to know, how can you have more than one incident commander during an incident, like having two bosses, um, everything he's had for training? Sure. Uh, and that's really, that's a very, who, who asked that question? Mark, did you say? Yeah, great question, Mark. And this is no, and, and, and this is where, yeah, this is where this is where training becomes critically important, because unified command says it's not really two incident commanders; it's two people functioning as one incident command voice. And to be frank with you, the way I teach this is that functionally, here's how it has to work: it's as though you've taken those two individuals who have decided that they're going to make joint decisions. So it's not a contest from the beginning. And you handcuff them together. Me? Mic check here. Uh, are we totally cut out right now? Yeah. Oh, hold on. How about now? And that's never happened before, so Okay. Okay. All right. No, we're good. Uh, what we can do is uh, offer to. Mic check. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. Mic check on this one. Okay. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one two three four. How about on your computer, Chad? Is it you get sound? Okay. Oh, great! They just tell me. <laughs> okay, we missed the injury. Testing one, two, three, four. Can you hear Steve? No. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing, testing, testing. I'll turn mine off. Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three, four. I think, the, I think it's one of those uh, computer things. Well, what about happening, Bob? You had a question? Ask him that if, can you communicate with him? Okay. And say again. How about, how about Scott? I'm coming through? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, let me, let me uh, let's make the assumption that, Mark, that, that you can hear me out there and I'll continue with the question. Unified command is important. It takes training to do that. And the way I teach it is, as a practical matter, you take those two co-incident commanders and certainly they've had training and they understand one another. In other words, the first time you meet someone who's likely to be your co-incident commander shouldn't be at the emergency. If you've followed and done training and had exercises and gotten your local responders involved, it should be, oh, hi, Bill, not who are you, okay? So there's some level of credibility that should already be established. And frankly, the only way it works is that by mutual consent, you have to have, good, you have to have 
handcuff those two incident commanders together and only give them one radio, so to speak, so that they're forced to speak with one voice. And it's a discipline, but it's no greater a discipline than anything else that we do under ICS, and it can be done. And frankly, right now, the biggest obstacle to that is uh, typically local fire and police departments um, having greater awareness that more and more in the private sector and in non-governmental organizations, they're going to encounter people who are well-trained and well-able to function under the incident command system. And that's a big part of what I do is to make sure that fire and police departments know that and are aware of it and are willing to go into unified command because it is the national protocol now. So I hope that hope that's helpful. But it does take discipline and there's an obstacle in some sectors where turf wars and those sorts of things need to be done away with. But it can be done and I've uh, I won't go into into great detail, but there was a situation in Torrance where we had a uh, significant problem in the beginning with a large uh, private business in town where we had a real conflict in that particular area. And at the end of about a five year period we had what was sort of a showpiece nationally on how to have two agencies work together. And it worked very well. And Unified Command was a key to that. Or something like that. In this case, it was back in the interim on an SRB. Um, okay. 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 That's a, yeah, Bob was talking about the fact that in most industries the planning cycle is really quite long for complex projects and takes a lot of advanced planning and thought. And his question to me was, in the case of an emergency, how do you quickly come up with an incident action plan that's, that's meaningful in some way given uh, the time constraints? And the actual the answer that's very simple. You don't have any choice. Um, the good news is, in ICS, there's a standard set of incident response priorities. It's always life safety first, then property protection that's critical to uh, not having the incident get worse, or what we call incident stabilization. We may not be able to make the incident go away, but what do we need to do to neutralize it so that it's not going to get worse and hopefully then begin to get better? Then property protection, then con con conservation of the environment. And with those are your priorities, you basically use that checklist. Are there people currently injured or immediately in harm's way? That becomes your number one priority and all of your resources go, go in that direction. Uh, sometimes, and most often is the case, a combination of life safety for threatened populations or people who are in harm's way right now and incident stabilization, that becomes a a co-first priority because in doing the one, you're going to enhance the other. And then you, and it's also dependent on what resources you have at hand. You can only operate with the resources that are in your pocket. But thinking ahead, one of our priorities is always don't wait for the situation to get worse before you order up more resources. So we always need to go with the assumption that this incident is much likely to get worse before it gets better. So let's begin to order resources now based on a worst case scenario. And at the, in the hills of California, that was something we were really bad at in the past where by the time we realized we were going to have a big fire, it was a really big fire and it was five miles up the road. And so now they order basically the whole world right from the get-go. It's a whole lot easier to send resources home than not. But using, and as you get training, there's, there are classes on how do you create an incident action plan that talks about what are these priorities, what sort of resource allocation would you make first? What sort of resources are available to achieve certain objectives? Where do you get them? And those sorts of things. So it helps in speeding that process along. Is that helpful? I get to the, okay. Yeah. 
But the bottom line is sometimes it's quick and dirty in the first operational period, which might be the first five or six hours. You're, you're just scrambling for life safety and incident stabilization. And that's why getting a planning function going, let's say I'm the incident commander, I'm wearing all five of those functional hats. One of my first hats that I'll take off and delegate if I say, this incident's not going to go away in the next five minutes, get someone assigned that planning role so that while I'm managing the emergency right now, they're busy trying to get ahead of it for me and put a plan together. So that's a critical part of the answer as well. Yeah. Anything? Well, I was going to add to what you're saying in terms of what would speed it up would be, I mean, that's right for peace come into play, right? When you know someone that knows the process, what's going on, who's been there and done that, that's a kind of minimize the time. And right. Time everything. Yeah, absolutely. The comment was another thing that could speed up the process is if you are already familiar with the ICS, you use that language, you use that functionality, that in itself is going to speed up the planning process and the execution process, and you're exactly right. Okay, while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions, one of the things that I'm uh, pleased to tell you is that, uh, you know, being retired from the fire service, in one sense, I don't need a job. And one of the reasons I work with risk management professionals is it's a way for me to give back to a career that's been really good to me. And living here in Southern California where our four seasons seem to be fires, floods, earthquakes, and riots, um, being prepared is, is critically important because we know here it's not if, it's just when and how bad. And so, uh, I'm dedicated to helping people be prepared, both in terms of creating emergency response plans and doing ICS, NIMS training and exercises. And so if we can be of assistance to you in that way, one of the things that I and my partner, Ken Hall, who just happens to be an associate of mine from Torrance Fire Retired, and we work with risk management professionals, one of the things we bring to the table is we have real life experience managing large emergencies. Uh, I won't bore you with the details, but some of the incidents that I've been in charge of in my career, you probably saw on television if you're old enough. So we know what it's like to be in these situations. Uh, we, since our fire service careers, we've now worked on the other side of the table where the interests of industrial facilities and whatnot are a re of real importance to us and recognizing their needs and concerns and helping them to integrate with local response agencies and stuff gives a, a real value added to what we do. So. We'd be pleased to help out in any way we can. If I had a mic, I'd echo the, the thank you to you for working with us on that. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks. Steve Barr, the chief marketing muck here. At, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we have a good time doing that as well. So I hope, hope this morning's presentation has been helpful to you in some way. If you do have questions, feel free to email RMP, and they'll make sure that I get them, and I'd be happy to respond to you personally by email. Okay, thank you. Signing out.